Now, uh, Spinoza was expelled from the Jewish community in Amsterdam, from the Sephardic synagogue, in uh, 1656. And um, only a small amount of documentation has survived about this. So all that really tells us is that the, uh, the rabbis uh, convinced the Panassim, the elders of the Sephardic community in Amsterdam, that this was a really uh, subversive figure, who both whose we're told that his opinions were terrible, but they don't explain exactly what that meant, uh, and uh, some of his actions as well. We don't know what the actions were, obras, in the Portuguese, but this probably means uh, not so much uh, offenses against observance, but probably persuading other young people uh, that uh, to take a defiant attitude to certain aspects of rabbinic authority. So the first thing we know about Spinoza is that he is a rebel against Jewish tradition and rabbinic authority. And that, of course, has made him obviously a notorious figure within the Jewish world, and in the, he became a notorious figure certainly in the wider Western world. But uh, he's mostly remembered, and uh, there's still debates about this even now. In, in Amsterdam, uh, a year or two ago, there was a, a revived uh, debate about whether um, it was possible to lift the r rabbinic ban. Uh, there were two rabbis, I was there myself, there were two rabbis present, and each took a different opinion. So it remains <laughs> inconclusive and unresolved still to now, uh, still down to today, how far um, the rabbinic ban still applies to uh, Spinoza. But uh, what is very certain is that he was remembered in the Jewish world and in the non-Jewish world from 1656 down to now as the very embodiment of irreligion, rejection of religious authority, and skepticism about the divine character. According to Spinoza, it's not divine, but was written by actual people who also happened to make a number of slips and even mistakes. And to get the science all wrong, he, he, he mentions uh, Joshua's belief that the um, that the sun goes around the earth is a very clear piece of evidence that the people that wrote scripture didn't understand the basic uh, laws of science. Um, and uh, for the non-Jewish world equally, this is almost the, the, the classic embodiment of irreligion in modern times. He was born in Amsterdam, of course, and was the son of um, a prominent Sephardic merchant who uh, had uh, Michael de Spinoza, Spinoza's father, actually was brought up in Nantes, which seems to me very significant for his biography. I I'll say more about this uh, a little bit further on. Uh, there was a very small community of Portuguese new Christians, that's to say uh, Portu uh, descendants of Portuguese Jews who had been forcibly baptized and made to observe, coerced into observing Christianity, whether they liked it or not, by the Portuguese crown uh, at the end of the 15th century. And among the descendants of these Portuguese New Christians, it's important to uh, divide them. And we have reports about Nantes at the time that Spinoza's father was being brought up in Nantes. And the same would be true of the Portuguese New Christian groups in Bordeaux and in other places in France, because this is how the French kingdom was in the, in the, in the late 16th and in the 17th century. They were still... Um, living outwardly as Christians, but they were divided into two groups. Those who realized they'd been coerced into Christianity but were not really concerned to resist and were content to go along with that because this is what government and church insisted on, so they went along with it. One group among the Portuguese and Christians, but there was another group who were subversive uh, crypto-Judaizers who were keeping alive Jewish tradition and Jewish religion secretly among the Portuguese New Christians in these French towns in the late 16th century and early 17th century. And we know for certain, we have very clear evidence about that, that Spinoza's grandfather, his granduncle, and his father, who were all in Nantes in the 1590s and in the years around 1600, were not amongst the quiescent people who were, uh, as it were, going along with the forced Christianization of the uh, of the Portuguese, the former Portuguese Jews, but were active crypto Judaizers. That's not speculation. We know absolutely certain, hundred percent, no question about that. That Spinoza's father uh, uh, family, uh, father's family, the mother's family too, but that's another issue. But the father's family, who were in Nantes, uh, were active crypto Judaizers for certain. It's not a, 
I know there's conjecture and speculation about other individuals. Was he really a crypto Jew? But that doesn't apply in this case. There's absolutely no question. Active crypto Jew, there's no question about it. Now, um, <clears throat> in, uh, f- f- for, it may be that Jewish tradition actually has less difficulty with the feature which, from a religious point of view, is most revolutionary about Spinoza uh, than Christianity does. Because uh, what Spinoza, in the non-Jewish world, what Spinoza was most notorious for in the late 17th and 18th century was uh, denying, he, he claimed he wasn't an atheist, although he was very frequently accused of being an atheist. He denied that there is a knowing, benevolent God who is separate from nature and the world and who uh, created the world. Uh, nor is the course of events and what happens in the world governed by a knowing divinity. So there's no such thing as divine providence for Spinoza. He denied the possibility of divine providence, and that means that there's no such thing as divine uh, reward and punishment for the way you behave in this world. So what your behavior is, you might be rewarded or punished in terms of living a good life and being happy about yourself or being a wretched individual who's not happy about oneself, but that, partly, that largely depends on you. And the reward and punishment is not something that's dealt out by a divinity. But actually, uh, in ju- some strains of Judaism particularly, I mean, it's well known that certain strands of the Kabbalistic tradition of Jewish orthodoxy in Eastern Europe do tend to go rather far towards a pantheistic conception, which is arguably not so very different from the kind of conception of God that Spinoza had. So you could argue that although Spinoza's God and Spinoza's redefining of what religion is, because because there is no God to pray to for Spinoza, uh, because there is no divine providence and no divine governance of the world, uh, the acknowledging the reality of God and awareness of God, uh, for Spinoza means having a A philosophical, um, uh, that for him means realistic, philosophical for him means realistic understanding of the world, of the universe, and of reality. And uh, the essence of uh, religion, as he redefines it, then becomes leading a moral life. And the most important strands of an ethical life, a moral life for Spinoza, are justice and charity. So justice and charity in Spinoza's philosophy, in the ethics, Uh, also in the political writings, receive a very particular emphasis. So um, if you redefine religion in that way, uh, what you've done is to carry out a kind of revolution. So I don't think there can really be a question that if you look at it in terms of the moral order, the way humans conceive of the moral order that underpins the legal system and politics and conceive of religion, if you redefine religion in this way, To that extent, Spinoza is clearly a revolutionary. But I want to take this uh, analysis much further and look at other ways that this extends and to show, I hope, or try to show, that Spinoza was indeed a revolutionary thinker. Now, um, uh, you should know something about uh, the fate of his publications in his own lifetime, because this is very relevant to this. He he wrote these books. He spent a tremendous amount of time. In fact, he spent all of his relatively short life trying to develop his philosophy to the utmost he could and to perfect his expression of his philosophical points in the ethics, his number one masterpiece, in the Tractatus Theologico Politicus, which I'll call the TTP for short, uh, the TTP, which is his second most important work, and in the unfinished political treatise. So two of the three most important books are actually uh, political, but it's very important to realize, I don't think, although philosophers, I think in the past, have often made this mistake and said, well, the ethics, that's the real philosophical work, so we'll forget about the political stuff and just, you know, we'll discuss philosopher, uh, uh, Spinoza as a metaphysician, as a moral philosopher, very important, we'll, we'll analyze Spinoza's ethics, but we'll forget about the politics. That's often been the attitude. That's completely wrong. Uh, Spinoza is you can't, can't separate the political thinking. It's a point on which Michael and I completely agreed. Uh, this is absolutely integral to Spinoza's outlook. Now, um, the, however, do notice that the moment his works were published, uh, 
in what was the freest country for freedom of expression in the 17th century, at least before the Glorious Revolution in England, England was outclassed by Holland. That was the freest country, the Dutch Republic. And in the Dutch Republic, you could, freedom of expression by the standards of the time, reach quite far. So there's quite a lot that you could publish. What you couldn't publish <laughs> was Spinoza's Spinozistic works. So the TTP was, um, it used to be thought, because there wasn't a general ban until four years after it was published, 1674, but it's been shown that uh, there were local bans in place from the beginning, from 1670. So there's no question that this book was forbidden uh, from the beginning. And uh, after his uh, complete works, the Opera Possum, were published in 1678, they were immediately banned by general decree of the uh, States General. And there was then a supplementary decree saying everything Spinozistic, everything by Spinoza is absolutely banned in every respect by the Dutch Republic. Republic. Uh, they did make an exception. Of the, he published another book, his first book in 1663, expounding Descartes' philosophy. That wasn't banned, but the rest was. Uh, and, um, and that was regarded as Cartesian philosophy, although there are bits in it which are not really Cartesian, but they didn't notice that or didn't object to that. But they objected to everything else that came subsequently. And the opinions expressed in Spinoza's books are not allowed to be replicated or repeated or echoed in other books. Booksellers who infringe this, printers who infringe this, would receive very severe punishments, and we know that they did. People were imprisoned or very heavily fined for this. And uh, the, the, you're not allowed to possess copies. They, you have to hand them into the authorities so that it can be burnt. So they, they were, uh, more effort was put into suppressing Spinozistic books than any other books in the Dutch Republic. I mean, you, if you had Islamic books or Catholic books or uh, collegiate books or Sicilian books, some of these things were not looked on with great approval. Sicilian books were actually supposed to be banned, but nobody uh, put much effort into suppressing them. Spinozistic books were a bit different. A real effort was put into suppressing these, and we have a number of cases of uh, booksellers who were sent to prison for years. The punishment could be very severe. You do not publish Spinoza. That is absolutely banned by the freest republic in Europe. Well, that's really something. You need to <laughs> have gone pretty far to achieve that. And when you read these decrees of uh, banning the books, uh, the, the Dutch decrees, you can see it's two things. The preachers have been complaining about him a lot. So the number one issue was the... It's not just the apparent denial of a, of a providential God, although that, that's certainly part of it, but the complete re rejection of religious authority as such. According to Spinoza, there's no such thing as religious authority. There isn't any religious authority. There can't be any institutionalized or legalized or politicized basis for a religious opinion playing a guiding role in society. There, there's no ever any justification for religious authority as, as something separate from the state. Well, that was one of the reasons why everything Spinozistic was completely banned in a way that other things that were disapproved of by the Dutch government were not banned to the same extent. The other thing was the criticism of the rather, uh, Spinoza was certainly a Republican, but he wasn't the same kind of Republican as the sort of Republicanism which was official and which was established, uh, which was based on a rather narrow oligarchy, so we could call it a form of aristocratic republicanism. And uh, Spinoza uh, contains some fairly fierce uh, criticisms of the way uh, of, of this kind of republicanism. So that probably played a part in it as well, but although rejection of religious authority was certainly the number one reason. Now, um, <clears throat> uh, this is the book, uh, the first of his books to be banned, the one that was banned in the early 1670s, the TTP, uh, as I call it. And uh, th this caused a tremendous sensation and had a big impact all over Europe um, because it contained all the elements I just mentioned just now. But what was seen so, uh, it wasn't just the statement of those points as, as philosophical propositions, but uh, this, this book is actually a landmark in the history of biblical criticism. No one had ever before um, analytically examined uh, the use of phrases and words and the, 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 uh, the actual uh, characteristics of the text with such care and systematically shown 
uh, as he claimed to do here, that there were inconsistencies, contradictions, uh, differences of meaning using uh, uh, the same phrases and so on, uh, relating to different historical periods, which showed that the uh, that scripture, the Hebrew Bible, he, he's very, very discreet about his comments on the New Testament. He, pres he, he prefers not to commit himself too strongly to that, but he uses his expertise in Hebrew, which was considerable, to, uh, to introduce a level of um, analysis of, of Bible criticism, which had a very bit, had a sensational effect all over Europe. And uh, it, the book was so disorientating and so, uh, so upsetting to many people that one can easily understand why it was ba banned with such vigor. Notice that they don't put his name on the title page. Uh, somebody has, has, has put, uh, what have they put? Uh, ben Benedict de Spinoza. Uh, it's worth saying that uh, about just about the name in parenthesis that of course we, we most frequently today still call him uh, Baruch Spinoza, not just in the Jewish world, but many non-Jewish writers refer to him as Baruch Spinoza. Uh, that was his synagogue name, and when he was expelled from the synagogue in 1656, the, the elders of the synagogue say they're expelling Baruch Spinoza. <laughs> and uh, it, but he's named actually after his mother's father. His mother's family was very interesting as well, by the way, but I haven't got time to say anything about uh, Hannah Deborah this evening. Uh, that will be for another occasion. Uh, but um, her, so his mother's father, her, her father was called Baruch Asorio. So uh, Spinoza was uh, named after his mother's father. Um, but uh, Spinoza himself, in all the letters, we've got about 80 letters of Spinoza, uh, they all date from the period, uh, from quite a while after his expulsion. That's a problem for biographers of Spinoza, that we don't have any of his letters uh, earlier than 1661, which is five years after that expulsion. If only we had some letters from a bit earlier, that would be a wonderful source for biographers. Um, but uh, you see it certainly from 1661 on all the letters and in all um, other uh, in the title pages in, in the Descartes book. He, he doesn't put his name on this one, and he, he's on the notorious opera posthuma of 1678. His editors, he was dead by that time, it was published in 1678. You just get the three initials, which became absolutely notorious. It was a kind of became a sort of symbol and a code in the early 18th century. BDS, and everyone knew what that meant. BDS was something that sent a chill down the back of a lot of people <laughs> in the 18th century. Um, so that was published under BDS. This one is there's no name at all. And th by the way, uh, every, uh, the rest is false because it wasn't published in Hamburg, but in Amsterdam. And this uh, that this printer didn't exist. The date's right, but the rest is is false. But that's typical of uh, what historians sometimes call the clandestine. Um, Enlightenment of the, of the late 17th and the early 18th century, which I'd say a bit more about further on, and a lot more about in the second lecture, which is there will be quite a bit about this, this clandestine enlightenment. Uh, well, um, the, it's very important to understand, and this book is not just about Bible criticism and an attack on religious authority. There's a lot of politics in it as well, and the politics is clearly democratic republicanism. In the key passages of his writings, Spinoza makes clear that his principal aim was not to spread irreligious attitudes, but rather to promote freedom in the sense of individual freedom, but also collective freedom, which makes him a really rather important um, innovator. Uh, and his aim is to fight tyranny, which, and tyranny for him means political tyranny in the sense of unjust uh, coercion and unjust uh, distribution of opportunity and resources in society, uh, but it usually means um, coercion, a form of tyranny usually means political coercion supported and supplemented by religious authority. And of course, that reflects the world in which he lived. If you think of the tyrants of his time, uh, in his own time, Holland was most threatened by Louis XIV, and, and Louis XIV is famous, of course, for his intolerance and for his espousing of the Catholic Church, and the way Louis XIV meshed together royal absolutism and Catholicism. They march together, and they squash everything else. That's the world I want, said Louis XIV. I want to hear nothing except the kings and the power of kings and the Catholic religion imposed on everybody. And 
Uh, but actually, Spinoza doesn't talk about uh, Louis XIV, who was the main threat to the Dutch Republic uh, in his time. The great, in, in, in uh, this book and in his other political treaties and in his letters, where, where there are a number of references, you can see it's not so much Louis XIV, uh, but rather Philip II, the most powerful of the Spanish kings and the one who had been the greatest supporter of the Inquisition, the greatest enemy, you could say, of the crypto-Jews because he'd pushed hardest to try to destroy Judaism as far as he could, also secured the expulsion of the Jews from parts of Italy like Milan, which uh, Spain uh, dominated at that time, in the time of Philip II. And um, he, Philip II, uh, in, in a sense, was a kind of predecessor to Louis XIV in the sense that he said, we, we, we want to get rid of constraints on royal power. What politics and administration is, is the king ruling and overruling everybody else. It is royal power imposing itself without restraint, royal absolutism. And you cannot impose royal power with the force that I need, said Philip II. You can't do it powerfully. You cannot coerce to the extent that I need to coerce uh, without the force of religion. Because it, it, it's the people's belief, the belief that only Catholicism is right and the rest must be eliminated and must be thoroughly, thoroughly suppressed. It is that belief which enables me to impose myself on society as forcefully as I do. So it's this conjunction of royal absolutism with religious intolerance, this alliance of uh, tyranny with religious authority, and whether one is religious or not in today's sense uh, is irrelevant to this. The fact is in early modern times, of course, Spinoza is right, there is a close conjunction between the two things, and you certainly can't understand uh, Philip II's despotism or Louis XIV's despotism without realizing that they were extremely aware that they couldn't do it, they couldn't achieve what they were trying to achieve, they could not impose themselves on society in the way they were trying to do without the force of religion. That was the thing that enabled them to achieve uh, royal absolutism in the way that they did. So to that extent, you have to, I think, accept that Spinoza's analysis uh, was certainly accurate. Um, but it's, so you have to rebel against tyranny and you have to rebel against absolutist kings. But it's no use just doing it any old way. <laughs> and Spinoza was certainly not a revolutionary in the sense that he wanted to just stir up uh, anybody who was dissatisfied with the state of things and was willing to organize a rebellion uh, against kings. He thought that's a complete waste of time because the multitude, and his definition of multitude is not, not a Marxist definition, he doesn't mean the lower classes. Uh, when he speaks about the multitude, he means the people who think in a conventional way, who don't understand uh, philosophy, uh, of the, the kind of philosophy that he taught. So uh, the multitude includes the clergy and aristocrats and kings. Actually, everybody is the multitude, except the ones who, who understand the reality of things. But the people who understand the reality of things can come from any class. And of course, uh, one of his chief supporters, Yari Gillis, was a, a grocer. But you could be anything. If you could, uh, you needed to be able to read, I guess. But if you were willing to enter into the spirit of uh, the, the, the kind of ideas that he was teaching, that meant that you were not part of the multitude, and it had nothing to do with your economic circumstances. Um, he gave the English Revolution as uh, a good example of how revolutions could go wrong. Uh, when he was young, uh, in the 1640s, of course, this is, there's this great uh, revolution in England, um, but if the people uh, undertake a revolution without much grasp of what's going on, that isn't going to lead to anything useful, according to Spinoza. All you do is to get a king under another name. So he's, he's very caustic in his remarks about Oliver Cromwell. Uh, and he uses Cromwell as an example of... Um, uh, Spinoza is saying that uh, most of society uh, is living in an oppressed and tyrannized over and rather unhappy condition. It uh, doesn't have to be that way. It, it could be changed. Uh, the majority of people are oppressed because of this alliance between uh, a form of government which is against their interests, monarchy, uh, in alliance with religious authority. Uh, you, you, to overthrow it implies a revolutionary change. But having a revolutionary change doesn't mean you just start the general insurrection because that's not going to get you anywhere uh, if it's motivated by the wrong kind of thinking. And Cromwell, for him, uh, perfectly illustrates this rule. Now, um, 
for Spinoza, there are basically two kinds of government, and this is characteristic of the radical enlightenment, which really starts in this period. I'm not trying to say that Spinoza is the inventor or originator of the radical enlightenment, because there were, there were a whole group of people around him. Historians sometimes call them the circular Spinozist. He's not the first to express these kind of political ideas, which you find in the 1660s in several other Dutch writers, in particular, Johan de la Cour, Peter de la Cour, um, and uh, Franciscus van den Enden. Um, but uh, what they all have in common, and this is enormously important because you don't find this in England or America at all until the late 18th century. It bursts on the scene with the American Revolution, this kind of thinking, uh, with Tom Paine and, and uh, a whole group of others. Benjamin Franklin is one of those, that, in, and Jefferson is one of those that picks it up. But they're picking it up on the continent, it, mostly in France. Um, of course, Frank, both Franklin and Jefferson spent a, long, a lot of time in France. But, and I don't think it's English in origin. But this uh, attack on this understanding that uh, kings are no good, we have to do away with that. Uh, but aristocracy is no good either. It's no use replacing monarchy with aristocratic republicanism. And most of the republics in Europe, remember in Spinoza's time, you had Venice, you had Genoa, but these are aristocratic republics. Uh, and uh, so they're attacked very much also by these Dutch writers. And what you have to have is something they call democratic republicanism. And they are really the first to introduce democratic republicanism in opposition to aristocratic republicanism, which was destined to become a great theme in the American Revolution. But that's, that's another story. Anyway, um, you see in the TTP in chapter 18, for example, Spinoza writes that it is very difficult and dangerous to get rid of a monarch, even if it is clear by every criterion that he's a tyrant. A people accustomed to royal authority and held in check only by it will despise any lesser authority and hold it in contempt. And then he says that the English people had provided a great illustration of this. Um, <clears throat> but uh, in, if you're going to improve conditions in society and reduce ecclesiastical uh, sway, um, you have to, and you can see this in, in uh, Spinoza's account of the Dutch uh, rebellion, uh, where he's a bit more inclined to mince his words than he, he usually is. He's very direct, Spinoza, and he's, despite the revolutionary character, as I see it, of a lot of what he's saying, he doesn't very often um, kind of uh, uh, disguise what he's saying under phrases or uh, evasive ways of expressing things. He does a bit, I think, in his account of the Dutch revolt, but he obviously thinks the Dutch revolt is a very good thing, and uh, in fact, all revolts against Philip II, who, as I say, was his great enemy, are a very good thing. He, he discusses uh, two um, examples in detail in the TTP and in the Tractatus Politicus, his other political work, which was left unfinished when he died. Um, and those are the, uh, the Dutch revolt against uh, Philip II. That's, of course, really got going in 1572, uh, but had to contend. A long war set in in the Low Countries, and they had to contend with the brutality of the, uh, the Duke of Alva. Um, and then uh, he discusses the revolt of Aragon in, um, in, in 1590. I'll say a bit more about that um, further on. Uh, but uh, the right, the, the, well, let, let me just say a little bit about um, the, the Portuguese aspect, which is very interesting first. This is Dom Antonio, the prior of Crato, pretender to the Portuguese throne. Now, of the three revolts against Philip II uh, that would have been relevant to Spinoza and his family, he has some detailed things to say about the Dutch revolt, as I said just now, and some detailed things to say about the revolt of Aragon, which he's very interested in. He doesn't say anything at all about the revolt of Portugal, which started in 1580, and yet his own family were connected with that. And I think this is a very good example of how biography and family background can under help you understand the implications. Also, where a certain orientation in a great thinker's thinking comes from, but how it could be perhaps refined and reworked uh, and gen more broadly organized to become what it became in, in Spinoza's philosophy. So you need to know um, that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, until 1580, Portugal was completely independent from Spain. Um, uh, the young Portuguese 
King at that time, uh, in, uh, just in 1578, actually two years before, got himself killed in, in Morocco. So there, now there was a tussle, well, who was going to be his successor as, as King of Portugal? Well, Philip II uh, said he had the best claim, and the a large part of the Portuguese aristocracy and the Inquisition immediately agreed with that. But there was another claimant. He was, his problem was that he was illegitimate, but he was a, he was a, a grandson of a, an earlier Portuguese king, Don, uh, Don Antonio Prior of Crato, who is quite a colorful character. <laughs> and uh, he, he had, uh, his mother was uh, a new Christian, Portuguese new Christian woman, and he himself had a number of love affairs with Portuguese Christian women. I don't think that's the reason why Portuguese Christians supported him in his revolt against Philip II. I think there's a different reasons for that, but they did. And uh, a, a large part of the population supported the revolt in 1580. Philip II had to send the Spanish army in under, uh, Philip, uh, under the Duke of Alva, who <coughs> suppressed this revolt too, fairly brutally. Um, but uh, awkwardly for Philip II, uh, Don Antonio escaped to France, and interestingly, he set up his base uh, near Nantes, although he had to keep moving around because the, France was in civil war. Uh, Philip II was the great ally of the French Catholic League. Large parts of France were under the control of the French Catholic League. They were determined to prevent Henry IV, who was a Protestant, remember, until he converted later to Catholicism. But only on the surface in order to make it easier for the French to accept him. Um, but, uh, but one of the Protestant areas was not. And uh, uh, he, uh, uh, he was able, with the help of some Portuguese New Christian merchants in Nantes, to organize a fleet which conquered the Azores uh, in 1583. So Don Antonio had the privilege of being proclaimed <laughs> king of Portugal twice. And uh, he ruled in the Azores for a couple of years, and Philip II had to send another, well, this time an armada, of course, to uh, conquer the Azores, uh, which he did in, in 1583 4. Uh, only Don Antonio escaped again and got back to France. Uh, so he really was a tremendous nuisance from uh, Philip II's point of view. Uh, and we know uh, that the, the uh, Spinoza's grandfather and granduncle. Uh, they, they, they were not uh, in Nantes yet, but when they, uh, they seemed to have settled there in the 1590s, but it's clear that they were not only leaders of the crypto-Judaizers, but that it, they were certainly participating in the help that the Portuguese new Christian merchants in Nantes were giving to uh, Don Antonio. And this is, we have some documents from the 1590s which show quite clearly that this is happening and that uh, his granduncle, Abraham Spinoza, was certainly involved in the anti-Spanish political activity in uh, Nantes in, in the 1590s. So that's, that's rather important to know, especially in the light of letters from Philip II's ambassadors in different parts of Europe, they say, you know, that Don Antonio has, keeps escaping every attempt to capture him is a really big problem. He's got some kind of agreement with the Jews, with the Portuguese New Christians. He's going to greatly curtail the Inquisition if he, were, if he were ever able to become king of Portugal. Uh, the, the, the Spanish ambassador in Venice wrote back to Madrid saying, in Venice, both the formal Jews in the ghetto and the Portuguese New Christians living outside the ghetto, both of them are very active supporters of this Don Antonio. It's a big problem because here you see what's very interesting in that report, that of course the Jews are, are encouraging crypto-Judaism in the peninsula, so there's a religious subversion that they're directly participating in. They send prayer books, they send encouragement, they have different ways of keeping it alive, crypto-Judaism in the re Republic, in, the, in, the, in, sorry, in Spain and in Portugal. So you see uh, the religious subversion, but this ambassador was pointing out, but it's not just religious sub subversion. You see how among this group, political subversion against the monarchy work and their support for Don Antonio goes together with their crypto-Judaism, as indeed it does. So that's a very important part of, uh, of the background. Now, um, <clears throat> In, uh, in the Tractatus Politicus, and uh, you find it even more forcefully, I have to say, in, in some of the other writers of this circle I've uh, talked about, you'd find it 
this point expressed more forcefully in, in Johann de la Cour, for instance, uh, that uh, democratic republics are better than aristocratic republics, and that in republics where there had been a, a broader tendency uh, of decision making, um, that the, 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 the uh, vested interests always work in such a way as to help a narrow, a narrow group take advantage of the, the majority. So what had happened in, in Venice, for example, this is the Signoria in, in, in Venice, a painting of uh, Guardi in the 18th century, where the small council, uh, the Signoria, is in, uh, taking over more and more from the great council. And so this ten, you can see the same tendency in Genoa, the same tendency in the Swiss can uh, The Swiss cantons also have this thing where the, each canton, whether it's Zurich or Bern or Geneva, they did still have remnants of a great, great council tradition. But the uh, small groups of oligarchs, usually the richest people in, in town, had managed to, uh, to draw power more and more into the hands of the small council and marginalize the great council. And this was the very opposite of what should be happening according to, the, to these writers and according to Spinoza. So uh, I think that um, the most important part of Spinoza's political theory is the idea that uh, the reason that, a that the democratic republic is the best form of government because it's the one that, m that most reflects is most natural in the sense that it most reflects uh, the way that the state and civil society came into being in, in the first place. And Spinoza is very keen to stress that humans have a natural individual liberty and freedom, which they surrender part of to form civil society or the state for the sake of security, stability, and protection. No one wants to live in an absolute jungle where your life is risked every moment and where you're so unsafe that you have no enjoyment of life. So life is much better in a stable society where the individual is protected. But in order to form such a society, you give up part of your freedoms of the state of nature, and everyone does this equally. So the act of forming the civil society and the state is a sacrifice of individual liberty which is equal, which is given up by each person equally to achieve a common good. And that common good becomes the basis of his theory of democratic uh, republicanism. And uh, a, the, a gen general good or general will theory becomes extremely important to this radical enlightenment tradition from this point right the way through the 18th century. Rousseau, who is usually created with uh, the general will, uh, introduces a variant of it later, which is not the, not the real tradition, which you find more in Diderot and Dolbach and Condorcet and Volney and so on. So it does has a big future in, in, in France and in revolutionary thinking in the late 18th century. But what's important about it in Spinoza, which he usually refers to it as the general good, uh, is the idea that um, everyone has created the civil society equally and everyone has an equal right to that, that the freedoms and the advantages uh, that, um, that, that the democratic republic or the, 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 the state should provide. Uh, therefore, all governments can be divided into two kinds. Uh, and this is typical of the radical enlightenment all the way through. You find this expressed very clearly in Condorcet during the French Revolution. There are, I mean, theorists can talk about monarchies and this kind of republic and that kind of republic, and there are different kinds of state. But in reality, there are only two kinds of state. There are the ones where the advantages and power have been gathered into the hands of a small group whose vested interests then become the driving force behind the state, and everybody else is deceived, taken advantage of, and exploited to the advantage of those few. Now, this works most of the time, and most of humanity are oppressed in this way, but only because of superstition, Spinoza made. It's only because people believe that religion is the way to salvation, and because religious authority supports these vested, vested interests, that's why oppression is the usual role amongst humanity. Uh, but the more natural and the more just and the, more, uh, the, the, and the right way to, to uh, if you want to uh, equalize the advantages of society for everybody and everyone has a, an equal right to share in those advantages is the democratic republic. So it's not an accident. You see, Spinoza is the, there'd been a long, uh, of course, there, was, there were democracies in ancient times, but they were direct democracies, not representative democracies. And in any case, the ancient Greek philosophers 
none of them, <laughs> were in favor of uh, democracy. So Spinoza is the first democratic philosopher in the history of philosophy, and that is a revolutionary fact. I mean, anyone who knows anything about early modern Europe knows that to express democratic views is a revolutionary thing to do. It's extremely subversive. So in, in other words, uh, what I'm saying, and that's the, the brunt of my lecture really, is that you cannot separate the religious subversion uh, which is an attack on religious authority rather than an attack on... Individuals should be free to, to express their religious feelings in whatever way is right for them. But no individual's way of doing it is more right than anyone else's. That's up to the individual. But as far as the law, the moral order, the institutions, the state and education is concerned, there's no such thing as religious authority. So it's very, very subversive and revolutionary, and it is absolutely inseparable from this theory of democratic republicanism, which is so basic, to Spinoza, but also to the group around Spinoza. That's a very important thing. I mean, he's not the first to express the general will concept. Uh, I mentioned Franciscus van den Enden, who uh, several years before Spinoza in 1665 published uh, a book called the Freie Politik Stellingen, and uh, there the, um, it's called the, the General According, According Interest, the Alchemene Accordering, the Interest, is the uh, equal involvement of every individual in the good of the state. And uh, uh, the, if the, the, it's only by representing the interests of, every, of everyone equally in the policies and the attitude and the workings of the state and representing those in some way in the workings of the state that it can be said to be sustaining the, the, the general interest. And normally this isn't happening uh, and it's only a vested interest of a small powerful group who are benefiting from the way politics is organized um, in any given state. But the reason why it's usually like that is because of superstition and all the wrong religious beliefs which are turning the world into a miserable place, according to this, this group of subversive thinkers. <clears throat> now, uh, sorry, I should have shown Philip perhaps a bit earlier on. So there's, there's uh, uh, the symbol, Spinoza's symbol of, uh, uh, of tyranny, uh, the one that he discusses most, Philip II. Um, I, I should say just a little bit about uh, Hobbes and Locke. Of course, one problem with understanding, I think the reason why so many uh, scholars have uh, strongly objected to uh, my, I, I must say that it's extremely impressive, the rejection of my theory, uh, at least in one way, and that is the enormous number of historians who've joined in it. But uh, I have to say, I, personally at least, I don't think the arguments are all that good, but that's not the point. Uh, but I do think that one, one should look at some of the cultural reasons that might be having this effect. And if you look at all the standard histories of um, political thought, you'll see that the emphasis is always on Hobbes and Locke. And this reflects the fact that it's also part of the American political tradition. There is just this assumption that whatever modernity is and whatever democracy is and however we got there, there's one thing we know for certain and it comes from England. So we can begin with that. And that is terribly, terribly important in British culture but also in American culture. But it's completely wrong because uh, they, in, in 17th century England, although there, is the, the, there are two revolutions, the 1640s and 1688, but 1688 is the victory of... Uh, aristocratic republicanism. And uh, the, the republican theories are very important in 17th century England. You've got Harrington, you've got um, uh, Algernon Sidney. But the thing about Algernon Sidney is that this is a republicanism which bridges over, which occludes, uh, and it, it preaches mixed government and provides the opportunity for the aristocratic system to take over, which is, of course, exactly what happened in Britain in 1688. And in the American Revolution, one faction, the John Adamses and the Gouverneur Morrises and the Hamiltons and so on, they said, well, the British, we might be fighting the British, but at least they know how to organize a government. That's, we, we, want to, we want to have an independent government, but it should be based on the British idea. Aristocracy runs society. That's right. 
We want aristocratic republicanism. And that, that's, just, that's just as American, <laughs> believe it or not, as democracy. <laughs> uh, if you look, if you look uh, uh, at the American Revolution in, a, in, a, in an objective way, of course, it, in the end, ho well, that's not perhaps entirely clear, but let's say we hope in the end that the democratic republican tradition has won, won the struggle. But it was a real struggle in the late, a tremendous struggle in the late, uh, which reached a, an amazing crescendo of violent ideological politics I'm not talking about now, I'm talking about the 1790s. And, <laughs> and uh, the democratic republicanism ha had a hard time. But if you look at the European background, it is absolutely not in England, but in Holland that you find this in those writers I mentioned just now. And I think that's the, uh, that is the objection to what I'm saying. That, that just doesn't make sense. You know, how can it come from Golden Age Holland? There are a lot of people who can't accept that. Uh, it must come from England. So there's quite a cultural battle about this. Uh, and I, uh, that's the only re real reason I can find, because I must say the arguments are pretty hopeless. They're so bad that I, it's not even worth discussing them. I don't think anyone will replicate any of them in the discussion here this evening, because you, you, you can't. I mean, it's impossible. There's, uh, the comparison between the, the clarity of the conflict between democratic republicanism and aristocratic republicanism in Dutch gold, in this, among this group in the second half of the 17th century in the Dutch Golden Age and in English republicanism is so manifest and so obvious that there can't really be a sensible intellectual argument about that. It's just a foolishness to say, well, <laughs> but that's how it is. Um, but there we are. Um, <laughs> Uh, so let me go on then and just, uh, I should, we've only got 20 minutes left, so I should end very, very soon, I think. Um, but uh, if we're going to have any discussion, but I just wanted to say a little bit about the Aragonese revolt, uh, because there's one aspect of Spinoza's biography I've said nothing about so far, uh, which I think is needed to complete the picture. One of the things which I think anyone that reads Spinoza's political works is going to be a little bit mystified by one thing that seems very odd. Uh, I mean, Spinoza is level-headed, sensible, and persuasive most of the time. But there's one feature which seems completely out of line with that, and that is his extraordinary boast. Uh, probably quite a few people here have encountered this passage where he says, uh, you know, that all, all political theorists up to now have produced these kind of... Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, totally unrealistic uh, uh, imaginary systems, which in some poetic golden age might be a nice thing to have, but which aren't going to have any relevance because they are completely unrealistic. What we need is a political theory which is re which is useful and which is going to it, it, which is going to release mankind from the kind of tyranny and oppression and the and the frequency of wars. That's a point he frequently makes. The reason we've got so many wars is because of kings and aristocratic republics. If you have democratic republics defined in the way he does, we won't have all these wars, and that will be one of the important ways in which everything's going to be much better. Uh, and this seems very odd. I mean, it, uh, what, I mean, not, not the argumentation in itself about democratic republicanism. That's not odd. But what seems odd is what, how come this... Uh, this, this, this Jewish thinker who seems to be a bit reclusive and, and is living on his own most of the time, a very delicate health, uh, why does he think he's got some kind of special understanding of politics that even Hobbes and Machiavelli don't have? Because in this boast that I mentioned just now, he seems to be saying he's got a more realistic, uh, you know, that, that most political thinkers uh, are totally unrealistic. Uh, there are a couple, he mentions um, both Machiavelli and Hobbes a couple of times, that there are two political thinkers who are, you know, have got some realistic ideas, but not, not really that realistic when you look at it more carefully, uh, and, and that he somehow has a more realistic grasp of politics. And this, this, this is, where does that come from? So I think that that also has something to do with this uh, family background and this involvement uh, in all these um, revolts that I mentioned, and particularly in the Portuguese revolt in the 1580s and 90s. But I should say, he's very keen, his account of the revolt of Aragon is very rarely discussed by uh, historians of political thought. And it's interesting because he, in his own personal library, we have a, a list of a small number of books he still had with him when he died. One of them are uh, the, uh, in Spanish, uh, the Relaciones, the account of the uh, revolt of Aragon by this man, Antonio Perez. And uh, he, he mentions Perez a couple of times, and he says, what we, where we do know about the realities of politics, they tend not to come from political theorists, but from 
those that experience politics. And Antonio Perez is uh, as colorful a character as the other Don Antonio I showed before, who had an amazing career. Uh, as time is pressing, <laughs> I won't go into the details. Uh, but he is somebody who had been a political secretary, Philip II, who broke with Philip II, escaped from Madrid after being in prison for a while, who was one of the uh, focal points of the revolt of Aragon in 1590, which led Philip had to send another army to suppress this revolt and to change some of the laws which restricted royal authority in, uh, in Aragon. Uh, but Perez escaped as well. <laughs> Actually, per this Don Antonio and the other one met up in Windsor as guests of Queen Elizabeth at a later stage and exchanged stories about how they got away from Philip II and how they were plotting with just about anybody who was willing to join in <laughs> opposing the tyranny of Philip II. Uh, but it's interesting that uh, Spinoza puts him forward as some, now there's a man who understands the realities of politics and paraphrases several of his kind of maxims and his uh, rules about how politics works. So I see that as being actually very, very, very significant. Okay, uh, let me wrap up very fast because uh, we've got to leave a bit of time for uh, discussion. I'll just uh, uh, want to see what's left of the slides. Well, there's Antonio Pires' book. Uh, that's actually a different edition from the one, but it's a later one that in Spinoza's library. This is an earlier edition. Uh, it was uh, <laughs> one of the, so in that period for the late 16th century, it was one of the most politically subversive books around and clearly a favorite of Spinoza's. And uh, so there we see the collected works that came out in, uh, it's, it's got the date 1677 uh, uh, on it, although in fact it seems to have come out in 1678, although that's not entirely clear. But you see now it's, uh, we still haven't got Spinoza's name on it, but we have got this BDS that I mentioned before. And uh, his portrait was included, and Spinoza's portrait also became a kind of symbol of uh, this radical Enlightenment tendency in the 18th century. And uh, he's, this is, Johann de Witt is, is the one who, of course, led the oligarchic republicanism that the group around Spinoza were criticizing and critical of. And I just wanted to show at the end, as I'm going on on Tuesday in the second lecture, going to talk about Jewish traditions or traditions in Jewish thought where, Spino where the revolutionary role, the idea that Spinoza was a kind of eman a general emancipator of mankind and, that, and of the Jews as well, who of course were more oppressed and more ghettoized and more subject to marginalization and disabilities than any other group in European society. Uh, and Heine and uh, was one of those that, that really cast Spinoza in, in that role. And M Moses Hess was another one. And uh, I'll just conclude with the lecture with that. Thank you very, very much uh, for listening to me, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>